sound shake. Record guys. in the this cloud. Is, I mean, All right, it. now we're going to capture this. We got it. Now I'm going to make you host again. Make you the host. Yes. You are the host now. Okay. Back to where we began. Where we, where, where is we it? Is about? it? It's not your split screen though, is it? Is that correct? What we're seeing here. What are you seeing? What are our friends at home seeing? Um, exactly what you're seeing. Oh, we're, we're fine. This is great. This is fine. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about storytelling. Since the beginning of time, humans have enjoyed the world through storytelling. Since the beginning of time, that what we what we have done is we've told stories. You have to imagine that sixty thousand years ago, there were primates on the floor of the jungle, and some of those primates, the humans, stood up and we left the jungle. The rest of the primates stayed there. The, the apes are still there. The chimpanzees, the monkeys, the baboons, all of them stayed there. But we went out. We and went we, out and we conquered, conquered other, other parts, of parts of the world. world. And the reason and the we reason were able, we were to, do able to do that is because we tell, we tell stories. stories. You, have imagine, you have to imagine that, imagine that humans, humans living, living in the desert, desert some, some part of those humans, humans got up, got up one day and they decided, decided to move to the, the seashore. seashore. And at, and at the, the seashore, seashore they, they figured out how to fish. And how to and build, how build boats, boats and how to navigate, navigate by, by the stars. stars. And, then and then they came, came back, back to the desert. desert. And they told us, here's what we're doing. And they told us stories about living on the seashore. And over and over and over again, we heard those stories so that by the time we got there, we knew how to do that. We were experts at that before we ever got there. there. What, what happens, happens is we, we have, have something, something in our, our brain, brain called the amygdala. amygdala. And the amygdala is like an experience simulator. In other words, when we're hearing a story, it is as if it's actually happening to us. You ever have this experience? Because it happens to me all the time. You go see a movie. And when you come out into the bright sunlight for a little while, you're kind of still in the movie. I like these, I like these movies, The Fast and the Furious. What are we on, like 87 at this point? I really like the one where they drive fast and skid around the corners. I don't know if you've seen that one. But anyway, but I love those movies. And literally, when I come out for a little while, I'm still in the movie and I'm driving an old minivan. But for a minute, I just want to go around the corner and, and slide through the corners and stuff because it, it feels real. And as far as we know, no animals do that. It's not like you take your dog to the dog park and he comes back with a new skill he's not had before. They don't learn from others the way we do. We learn from these stories. So, but this amygdala is like an experience simulator. So when they put somebody in an MRI and they tell them stories about, about playing basketball, the, the brain fires off just as if they were actually playing basketball. Or they tell them a story about being in love and you fires off as though they're being in love. So it's like having a, a flight simulator. It's best to understand it like a flight simulator. What happens in a flight simulator? We take people in, we put them in the flight simulator. It looks like an airport airplane cockpit and they take off and they land, they take off and they land, they take off and they land over and over and over and over again. And then eventually they fly without the instruments and then they fly with a bad engine and all the stuff that can happen. They have thousands of flights. And then when they get in an actual airplane cockpit, they don't feel as if it's the first time. They feel as if they've been doing that for thousands and thousands of times. That makes us good because we're able to learn from stories. And like I said, as far as we know, there is no other species on earth that does that. We have a capacious appetite for okay. stories. Excellent. We have stories. I'll never be able to like no. The number one thing people saying? tell you in the hallway when you're just conversing all, with them is this watch the, what they watch right on here. Hulu. Or on Netflix. A sexy ass. This is nigga. a common thing. Well, if I was a girl in the middle of pandemic, but back when before the pandemic, everybody on Monday morning would tell you about the movies they saw over the weekend. Those are all stories. And then you think about all the stories, and you think about the theater, and you think about opera, and you think about all the books that the people are reading. And everywhere you go, we're simply consuming stories everywhere. Music is stories. We love stories because in the stories, we learn so much. A couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I went to Amsterdam. The Rijksmuseum, big, beautiful museum, one of the most beautiful museums in the world. 
And as you go in there, the one wall, the opposite of the entrance is, is one huge painting it's called the Night Watchman. And it is massive. It is 15 feet wide. It's about 14 and a half feet tall, 34 different people on this. And, and when you see it, what happens is everybody's going, you know, from uh, one painting to another, another painting, painting to another painting. painting. And then they get to the Night Watchman and they get to this one. And they're like, oh. what happens? They get stuck and they don't look away. Now, what happens? Why is that that they get stuck there? Because this is a story. It's not just a story, but it's a bunch of stories. All of these stories compressed together. 34 people, 34 different stories, all of it happening at once. And you just stand and you look at it. You all have artwork in the gallery in there. Do people get stuck on yours? They get stuck on my stuff? Not necessarily. We don't have that kind of captivating. But when, but then look, compare this, the Night Watchman, to uh, stock photography. Now, how long do you get stuck on this piece of artwork? You go, mom, son, homework, done. Eighth of a second. Move on. What happened? Why is this something you'll spend one third of your time at the museum looking at, and this is the eighth of a second, and you flip the page and you move on? Because there's no story here. Or if there is, the story is so incredibly easy to pick up in a tenth of a second that you're not engaged. See, all of this time that I tell you about, I was working in TV, I was working in movies, I'm working in, as a speaking coach. What do they all hold in common? It's about engagement. I win when I keep you engaged. You win and as a photographer when, when somebody, somebody goes, piece of art, piece of art, piece of art, and then they stop and they look at that. The more time that they're engaged with your art, the more you win. So you say, well, that's fine because this is a really nice, complex piece of art. But look, you know, come on. This is a simple piece of art. That's not a valid comparison. Well, what about this one? This is Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring. And it's one of the most beloved pieces of art in, in the world. And people have really speculated as to what's going on in this picture. There's a story here. And here's the thing, if you don't take anything else away from this, what, here's what I want you to get. Art is not what happens on the wall. Art is what happens to the person who views it. I'm a painter. I, I paint, I've got a lot of paintings in my house, and they're all in the bottom of my closet. Is that art? No. It's painting, but it's not art, because I'm not putting them out. I'm not... There's no engagement. There's nobody stopping and looking at that. Art is what happens when we look at the art. And here you look at this art, and they actually have done a movie about this, trying to figure out what's so enigmatic about this painting. So it looks like Vermeer, who was married, had this young lady who was a, who was a uh, servant, and they may have had a relationship, Vermeer and this young lady. And if you look at her, she looks... Well, she looks like she's a little bit vulnerable, but she also looks like she's looking at somebody that she's fond of and maybe attracted to, and there's something going on, and we get caught up in that story, and that's why that becomes something amazing. My daughter is a, a skilled uh, photographer, a professional photographer in uh, Atlanta, and she does lots and lots of portraits and lots and lots of, uh, actually a lot of architectural photograph, and I asked her one time to shoot my headshots for my speaking practice and when i got them back i thought they were good you know but i start working with them and putting them together for you know the back cover of the book or flyers that are going out or whatever and i realized there's something there and that was like oh, something really cool that was happening in those photographs and what i realized was that that guy me was looking at that camera my daughter and i love her she's my favorite person in the world and you can see it you could see the relationship. It's not a photograph of me. It's a photograph of the relationship. This is not a painting of the girl with the pearl earring. It's a painting of her relationship with the audience. Isn't that cool? So that's how, even if it's not complex, it can still be compelling. So what's happening between the art and the person? So if you've got a Picasso, maybe that's pretty complex. Maybe there's something going on there. But if you put the same... Uh, stock photography, yawn, you look at it for a second and you move on. Well, what about our photos? 
What about our art? What about our books? What about all the stuff that we do? Are they moving past it? It would be really interesting to go over there in the studio and put up a, a camera up in the ceiling and just see where people slow down and where they keep going and what they move through and what they move toward. Because when we were doing all these judging, I was flipping through all these things and you would see it. You would go, okay, okay, wait. wait. And then you back up and go, oh, oh, there's something there. What is it that's compelling you? And what's compelling is that there is a story there. So art is what happens to the people when they view it. it. We know it when we make movies, nobody makes a movie hoping that somebody will go, okay, and move on. They want to grab you, they want to compel you, they want to capture you. As a matter of fact, that uh, Chrissy and I were talking about this before we came in, is that they'll actually screen it in front of an audience and see, and the, they'll, they're not looking at the can, they're not looking at the screen, they're looking at the audience. Who's paying attention? Who's pulling out their phone? Who's nodding off? And, it, and they can see the exact moment where they lose somebody and they go, oh, well, that scene didn't work. What happened there? Engagement is the goal. I worked in TV for a long time and we had we would get Nielsen ratings every day and we'd run into work first thing in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, we'd print these off and we could tell you what point in our show we lost the audience and we would fix it. You know why? Because that was worth a million dollars. A one rating point in uh, in those days was worth one million dollars to the station. So we would fix it. Are we doing that with now, our art? Stop, stop. Are we, are we caring, caring that, that much, much about, about, about how engaged, engaged our, audience our audience is? Or do we or just, do we put, just it put it out there? And, and what happens? What happens? What happens? So, so. With me? With me? Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? amen. Michelangelo's, Michelangelo's um, David, David, and, 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 and we can that this is, is this is the, the tons and tons of art about David, about the story in the Bible, tons of art out there. But in many cases, they have David where he's already killed Goliath and they're holding up the head. But what happens there? Story's over. It's like going to the last page of your of your romance novel and finding out who 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 you know what happened. This is a story of what's going to happen. And because it's going to happen, it's like looking at the person who's about to jump off the diving board. That's interesting. When you're done and the puddles of all, all the rings and everything have, have subsided, that's not interesting. We need to capture it when it's interesting. And so uh, uh, Michelangelo has reached in here and he's found this young man. He's staring at what we'd assume to be Goliath, Goliath. He's obviously very muscular and fit, but he's also kind of wound up, ready for this to begin. And if you walk around this, uh, his, my client, um, David's left foot, you actually get the idea that his foot raises as you move past it. It feels like he's moving forward just a tiny step as you move past it. This is another Michelangelo. You can tell I'm an art major, right? I love these things. Michelangelo is amazing. But um, this is the Pieta. And this is uh, Mary with the with Jesus in, in her lap when after he's been taken off the cross and he's dead. And that is, to my mind, I think maybe the only picture I've seen, uh, a depiction of Christ dead. You always see him as sort of macho and vital and, and, and you know, forceful. And here he's not. He's really just like like a crumpled piece of cloth. But then we look at it's it's uh, Mary's looking down at him. And she's not crying, she's not sobbing. She's maybe resigned to the fact that this was the way the story had to end. That this was what she had always known was going to happen. But anyway, there's a whole story in this one thing. And that's why Michelangelo is uh, the favorite sculptor, sculptor in the entire world. But what about photography? This is a street photography. You think there's a story there? Do you have any idea what the story is? Magenta? Of course, we, we, we don't know. But there's a story there, and we get compelled by it because we're saying, oh, what's going on? This woman looks, she's got on two different earrings. She's got on the broad hat. She looks like she's probably a little bit over the top, you know, sort of. And she, maybe she's yelling at the photographer. Maybe she's just acting out. 
the two people on their sidekicks on either side are either going to back her up and take us on. I don't, we don't know, but it's very compelling. Now compare that to these three people shopping to these three people. Stock photography. Do you, is there any, is there, are you engaged at all? I mean, once again, in one eighth of a second, three women shopping, move on. This one? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I'd really kind of like to know what's going on with this story. You like, you like have you ever seen, seen the book, um, Humans of New York? York? Oh, it's fantastic. And it's just photo after photo. But in the little paragraph, he'll say something about, about the photograph. So, three women shopping, gone. No story, story, no story, move on. Here we go. Five teenagers standing in a field. But oh my gosh, is this compelling? Is this engaging? Is this a story? The two up front closest to us look like they are, you know, they're really embraced, but they look like they're more supporting each other than it's some kind of romantic thing. Like one of them might fall and the, and the female looks like she's a, a teenager. She looks so young. What's going on in this story? And so you look at that and you might spend some time looking at it. Now, this stock photography, five teenagers standing in the field. Yawn, eighth of a second, and we move on. Why? This is a story. This is not a story. This is nothing to look at. But you say, hey, I shoot portraits. All right, it's a portrait. Why is this so compelling? What's that? I'm sorry. He's perspiring. Well, yeah, uh, we don't we don't know if he's perspiring, if he's been through the, the in the water. We don't know what the story is. But, but then he's also got his hand on his face. face. That's, that's kind, kind of a self comforting gesture. gesture. You, you do, do that when you're nervous or you're or upset or something. And then, but he look in his eyes, and he's either three or sixty three. He's really had, I'm guessing, a tough life until this moment. And he's not looking for help. He's self-comforting. He's taking care of himself. And so you make up this whole story trying to figure this out. You're engaged. You're leaning forward. And then here you go. Stock photography. Same thing. Head and shoulder shot. Same, same. Why here? Why not here? There's no story. So some pointers to get to the story. Uh, Annie Leibowitz photograph. What does it take to get that kind of a story? You have to take time. So you can imagine this is Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop is a, a rocker, punk rocker. We think punk rock, we're not sure. Anyway, he's a, he's a, a rocker and a long time rocker. He's been around for a long time. Any Lee Boyce goes in, they say, we want to take a photo of Iggy Pop. He didn't show up with his shirt off. Now imagine the photographer, you're the photographer. He didn't show up with his shirt off. So Annie Leibowitz says, I've got to get to know the person. She talks to him. Who's really, you know, who is he really? What's going on with, with uh, Iggy Pop? How, and, and then she tries to actually understands who he is. Then she tries to figure out a photograph that would show that person, not the physical, but the actual person that's there. And so after some period of time, she convinces him to take his shirt off. And I have to say, this is incredibly compelling. If you look at his face, he looks like an animal. He looks vicious, like he might take you out. Like, and and he he's both uh, an eighteen-year-old body and a sixty-three-year-old man's body. What's going? How much drugs do you have to do to have veins pop out in your chest? What is going on in this story? This is this this is exactly Iggy Pop. He's take no holds barred, fearless, in your face kind of rocker. What a great photo! Now. Similar thing. This is our governor, Governor Schwarzenegger, not DeSantis. Uh, governor Schwarzenegger. Now, do you think he showed up that day with the steed in jodhpurs and boots and a cigar? No, she had to take time with him. And she sat down with the, with the governor and she said, okay, who is this guy? And the more she spent time with him, now this was in his prime, but the more she spent time with him, the more she realized that he was macho times a hundred macho times a thousand. He was more macho than any man you've ever met before or since. And how do you get that in a photo? Well, it helps to have jodhpurs and boots 
and a steed that's probably more muscular than he is, and a cigar in the mouth, and looking off into the future, because he still had a lot of future at this point, he wasn't yet governor. He wasn't doing all the things he's done since. And so that photo says, this is the most macho man that you'll ever meet. This says, this is a hard rocker who will take you out. You don't get this. Here's the, here's the point. We don't get there by showing up, holding out the camera, and snapping a photo. This takes time. It also takes chutzpah. Would I ask Governor Schwarzenegger to take his shirt off? Would I ask, if I'd be more likely to ask Schwarzenegger than Iggy Pop, because he looks like he's going to kill me. <laughs> Can I tell you an example? My daughter's a still photographer in Atlanta. She uh, got a job at a, um, even though she was a photographer, she got a job at a legal newspaper and they didn't have her doing photography because they had a photographer. Chris, an older guy, not as old as me, but an older guy does all the photography and Isadora did typesetting. But at one point, Chris has surgery and they put him in this cast and now he can't do photography, but they need a photo of the governor of Georgia. And so Chris and Isadora go together down to see the governor to get a photograph. They walk in the room and Isadora walks over to the governor and she grabs his collar and she straightens it like this and she moves his tie so that it's even and then pats his head a little bit because his hair is sticking out a bit. And she goes to start taking the photograph and she realizes the light isn't right this time of day. And she moved him around and said, would you mind sitting here? And she went over to the windows and she got that nice afternoon evening light and shot some photographs and went home. And she got in the car with Chris. Chris said, you are going to be fired. He said, I've done this for my entire life. I've, I've never, never touched, touched the governor. governor. I've never, never touched, touched one, one person, person when I've done that. You're going to be fired. Got back to the legal newspaper. Her boss wanted to see her. Took his door in the other room and said, I just got off the, off the phone with the governor. And he said, that little girl, calling my daughter, in her 20s, a little girl. That little girl was the first person in my 22 years in public service that cared enough to make sure my collar was right, my tie was straight, and my hair looked good. And I loved the fact that she wasn't afraid to move everything around to make sure that photo looks great. Nobody else cares if the photo looks great, but your little girl did. That's taking the time to get it right. This is um, Venus and Serena Williams. The tennis pros. All right. Do you think, can you imagine having this conversation? Tony, can you imagine walking in and telling these two girls that, you know, what would they expect the photograph to be? We're going to stand next to each other, right? How many photos have you seen standing next to each other? But to get these two to embrace, I mean, almost if you could, if you didn't know who they were, you would almost think that they were uh, romantically involved. But this takes Time. It's the point I'm going to make is it takes time and you have to work it. And that means getting heavily involved in the process. I'm bossy. I do a lot of videos. And as soon, well, actually, as soon as I came in here today, just as a speaking guy, I moved all the tables around. I brought in a light. I set this up here. All of this stuff. I, I'm bossy. I just do it. And I expect when I go in to shoot video somewhere, I will immediately begin moving stuff. I'll grab the plants and move it over. And people are like, what are you doing? My daughter got it honestly. We just want to get it right. And even if that means we have to ruffle some feathers. It takes time. This is from a series called 12 Years Old. What I want you to notice, what it takes time, notice here that Two of these children are no longer paying attention to the photographer. How did that happen? You guys know you show up with the, with the camera and what happens? Everybody turns to look at you. So this photographer had to be there long enough that the children became disengaged with the camera, except for our mini Farrah Fawcett. And Farrah Fawcett with her cigarette is ready to take you on. She's tough. What does it look like to be 12 years old? Well, in this particular case, Farrah Fawcett is somewhere between 12 years old and 38, going on her third divorce and cigarettes. But the point is, this didn't happen in 20 seconds. 
we make the mistake because we've got cell phones and because we're shooting photographs all the time of going out and we just grab our camera, snap, 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 get back in the car and we drive home. But this didn't happen that, that like that. This took time. The other thing I want you to notice is where is the photographer? The photographer is not standing like this. She's at least kneeling, if not lying on the ground, because we're looking straight into Farrah Fawcett's eyes. We're at her eye level. When Steven Spielberg did the movie E.T., he set out from the beginning, he said, the camera level is going to be at the little girl's eye level. Because this is told through her eyes. What's her name? E.T., the little girl is? Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore. She, they actually measured her height, got her eye line, and shot everything from that level. Because it's her story from her vantage point. See, how this is this little girl, one of the reasons why she's so intimidating is because we're at her height. Now, I'm not going to talk about my daughter the whole time, but when, when, I, when <laughs> Isadora <laughs> would send me photographs, I noticed she, she did a better job shooting children and babies than anybody I'd ever seen. And I never really understood it until we were at a family gathering. And while I'm talking to somebody, I look over and Isadora is lying in a full dress, laying down on her belly and taking photographs of the babies. Now, you can imagine laying down at a family gathering in the mud to take photographs. But that's, she also had the sense to know to get on that level. More of the same series. <laughs> it's fantastic, isn't it? Oh, I would love to have taken these photographs. And more than anything, I want to find out what happens to these little girls in 20 years because, my gosh, is there a story going on here? What, where are their parents? How do you get cigarettes at this age? Walking around with cigarettes and baby dolls. Makes, Makes sense. sense. Can I get an amen? Amen. Next thing, leave things out. I would contend that this is a bet, much better photograph because half of the frame is covered with, I don't know, somebody walked in front of the frame, don't know. But if, if she were, if our subject were front and center and everything else was happening behind her, not that interesting. But we got half the frame covered, and it looks like, I mean, she's a female. You could, you could, you could make suppositions. I would suppose this, that, that somewhere there's a man being a man, and he's just bustling around and not paying attention, and he walked right in front of the shot. But leaving things out, this doesn't tell you. The problem with the stock photography, it tells you the whole story. You know, eighth of a second. This doesn't tell you. We don't know exactly what's going on there. Leaving things out. One of the biggest things I have a challenge with is I like to overwork stuff and I work on it and I work on it and I work on it and it gets too busy. But this is crisp because it's left things out. Where the party never ends. All right. So what's going on in this story? Well, one, it is most definitely a story. We've got two black men, young black men. Uh, one's holding a very big teddy bear both of them are sort of keeping their hands behind themselves and they're standing wherever this is where the party never ends and it's just really a great story any idea what is happening are they waiting for his girlfriend are they waiting to ambush somebody why the party never ends it doesn't look like a party nobody looks happy very compelling but the point is that you didn't get this you didn't get this automatically. You didn't pop out of the car and get back in the car. You had probably had to stake out this sign and go, okay, that's cool, and wait for things to happen around it. Give it time. Now I'm guessing, because I'm a guy and I've got four brothers, and I know how guys think, which is not very good. And so I'm guessing that what happened here is the photographer is probably standing out by the road, taking photographs. And these guys drive by, and the one in the back says, I got an idea. I'm going to do something stupid. And so he said, drive around again. And then as he drives by, he decides to hang out of the window with a cigarette and a beer, chug the beer, and say something stupid. Does that sound, guys, you, you're with me? But that's kind of what we would do, right? Because that's, that's what you guys think. But that, once again, doesn't happen in the first 10 seconds. You can't be a snapshot and go and get that. They had to 
think about that and say, okay, what are we going to do? And you have to give it time. Be bold. This is your next thing. You have to be bold. You, these photographs are not going to happen with you in the third row uh, of the balcony and a telephoto lens. <laughs> Just not going to happen. You're going to have to be somewhere down where the action is. Now, I know I am with you. It's tough. Maybe I don't I walk through the back gallery again and see how many. <coughs> I turned it off on purpose, so it's not a mistake. Um, so I want you to hear this. I understand that most of us went into photography because we don't want to deal with real people. It's really nice to go to these family gatherings and everybody's chatting and you're supposed to chat and you go instead you grab your camera and you go around and take photographs so you're not involved. So you don't have, nothing's expected of you. When I was in high school, I was voted the quietest. You know what that means? When everybody gets, a, do they still do superlatives? With, with, Tony, superlatives in your high school, best looking, most likely to succeed. Yeah. They, they do, okay. I do. I'm old, so if this was like 1978, I was voted the quietest because I really never talked to anybody. I know what shy looks like, and I think some of shy may be apparent in what we see in the next room over there, is that we're not taking photographs of people because we're a little bit shy, and stopping people and saying, hey, I want to take your photograph is terrifying. Is that possible? Is it possible that we're avoiding that? And we're doing still life scale. You did a great job, beautiful stuff, because you don't have to actually talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I can just do this. And, and, and Christy, right? Sometimes it's just a little bit awkward to have to stop people and say, would you mind standing there? In order to make something, sometimes we have to be bold. We have to step outside of our comfort zone. There is not going to be a whole lot of exceptional photography that happens with a telephoto, telephoto lens, lens and you being in the third. And it's me too. I have to be bold. I have to be right in the middle of stuff because this photograph, where's the photographer in this photograph? The photographer is six to eight feet away from the back of this confrontation. He or she is in the middle of everything. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to get beat up. I don't want you to get shot. But I'm saying the difference between where this photograph is on the boldness scale and where most of us are is about seven miles. I'd like for you to come three miles my way. You know what I'm saying? If you could just be a little more bold, if you could just if you could just get into it, which my daughter, who was right out of college, did. She just got right up in there with the with the governor. It takes boldness, but you have to be bold. Leave space. Go go look at the photographs and ask the, the question. How many of those photographs leave space? And isn't it compelling when there is space left? <coughs> where there's something happening, but there's also some space for you to absorb it. They tell us that music isn't the notes. Music is what happens between the notes. And if we leave space, we leave a chance for people to absorb what is happening. I think this photograph, if it had had, if it had been centered, it wouldn't be nearly as good. If it had, if it had had a lot of stuff going on in this area, look at that. Two thirds of the frame is nothing. Why does it work? Because there's space there, and you get the you get the feeling of the impact. Boom! It's knocked him. He was probably in frame, and then got knocked backwards from that moment. It's hard for us to realize that leaving space is important. Find the emotion. Now, how many of you really like equipment? How many of you, I do this every day. Yeah, I do this every day and I get up and I look at the newest Sony cameras. Oh my gosh, how many megapixels is that? What's the dynamic range? You know, it's got image stabilization in the body of the camera and it's got image stabilization in the lens as well. Oh my gosh. For a video guy, it's so exciting. And then I get the equipment, and then guess what? Three months later, I'm like, you know what I need? I need that next camera. And I need the F FX. That's right. That's right. So this is Tony. So this is a really good example of this. This was probably shot by a non-professional. It was how many megapixels do you think this camera has? 
Not very many. It's probably a little snapshot thing. And, and, and the blacks are crushed. The whites are blown out. And you can see the grain in it. Why does it matter? It doesn't matter. One of the most important uh, stills photographs of the century and it was shot on a crappy camera with crappy lighting and and crappy film probably was film back then because somebody found the emotion if they had instead of shooting a video uh, still of her if they'd gotten a still of any other person there it wouldn't have been as compelling because all of those other people are experiencing it but we see the emotion in this girl look for the details this is about the time in Sudan, the, the, the crisis in Sudan is people starved. And you could take the big picture and show the, what everything that's happening in the big picture. But in some cases, seeing the detail is much more important than seeing the big picture. Having a few people, this, uh, this is an adult woman and that's her hand. But because of starvation, she's been shrunk down to the size of a, of a child. And then crap. I'm a video guy, guys. I am so jealous of you. I'm telling you, because you know, you can go out and you can have some pretty crappy framing and go back to the shop and you can reframe it by cropping. You know? Oh, that is so nice. I'm now I'm shooting, I'm beginning, I went from shooting standard definition, which is really terrible. You can't even look at standard definition video anymore. And then I went from there to uh, HD, which is 1920 1080 and it's fantastic and now i'm shooting 4k and with 4k i can actually crop some i can blow it up and reframe it a little bit in the edit but not like you guys can i mean you can blow that the heck up you can blow it all the way up and you can crop off you can cut off things and all that stuff that's a luxury plus you can do this is my, my frames, frames are always, always this, this uh, 16 by 9. 9 always whether i want it to be or not and so I have to always fit in that, but you can go, okay, this is fun. So our little dog here, love this guy. He's so energetic. He's taking a big bounce just for the camera, but the crop is interesting because if they had cut, if they'd included the entire human, it wouldn't have been nearly as, as interesting as this cropped photograph. So a lot of, I think a lot of things that I've seen could use a better crop and think about where to crop it. Okay. So let's talk about what we just talked about. All right. Who's got something to say about being bold? Be bold. Being bold. Come on. Are you bold? I'm bold. Are you? All right. Tell me an example of, uh, it's David, right? Tell me an example of, what's that? <laughs> That's Dick Weaver. Dick, I'm he sorry. He does a lot of travel photography. So travel photography. Yeah, yeah. So is it is it like street photography, but just in different places? Is it like street photography? You stand on the corner and you kind of uh, you know bother people as they drive by or they walk by. Yeah. Okay. So that's bold. And you get punched. Do people get mad at you? Got mad. I got punched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But being bold is where it's at. I mean, the street photographers stand on the street corner in New York City. Now, here's the other thing I want you to understand is we have to get up every morning and beat on our craft all day long. And, and it is. And, and you just make, I mean, I got to tell you, especially street photography, you shoot 10,000 photographs and they all are terrible. And then maybe you get lucky, you get two or three that are really good and throwing stuff away and yes I have a two -fold, two fold question about being bold um because one I, I document my family more documentary style but I also shoot professionally so I photograph families um more portrait style but trying to get that emotion and storytelling out of someone in a small amount of and they 
won't allow you to, or maybe one family member will allow you in, and the other family members do not. Um, I've spoken to multiple people about that, and I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on that. And then sometimes even documenting my own family, which the photos, I'm only allowed to share certain things, but I have a private uh, account that I do, and my family allows me to get in, um, into their faces and share private or photograph them doing private things that I'm not allowed to share. But there are times when they're like, no, you know, and I get the hand. Um, but, I, you know, it's just breaking down those barriers. I guess I'm, I'm asking for like how. How do you break down the barriers? How do you break down those barriers? So, when you are bold, but you're still getting sure, sure. No, it's a so if you're at home and you you haven't heard Anne, it may be hard for you to hear. What Anne is asking me about is how do you do that? How do you how do you break down the barriers? How do you get beyond? It's fine, good for Danielle to say, hey, be bold. But what does that actually look like? Because she shoots a lot of photographs of families, including her own family. Well, one, if you have a photographer in the family, you really get sick of it. I mean, I love my daughter, but I'm telling you, everywhere you go, it's just. <laughs> You just ah, at some point I get it, but that I, I love you know once again you got to beat on your craft you got to get up every morning and take the damn photographs, right? How are you going to get better? There is nobody in the world that gets better when their camera is in the drawer. You got to take the photographs. You have to make all the mistakes. Now we're in a lucky time. I when I was in college, it was film, and every roll of film cost you money. And it was expensive and now it's free and now we have these incredible cell phones where you get 12 megapixels on your cell phone but the, the question is how do you break down that barriers one i think any leibowitz turns people down because they're not going to be able to do this i, I don't know this for a fact but, but I, I would imagine, imagine when you, you get, get to, to that level, level you know, know okay, okay well any leibowitz is going to come in but she's probably going to ask us to do something we're not just going to stand there and have a photograph taken. So she has a reputation. It would be nice if you had a reputation for we'll great do a great photograph, but it's not going to take 12 minutes to do it. It's going to take like a couple of hours. Right. So that's being bold. And I'm with you all the time. I shot up and I, I set up and shot a video of an architect the other day. It's bold for me to say, I know you're late for lunch. I know you're, you know, tired of me already, but I need to change some of my light setups and move things around and I take another hour with her. It's bold of me to impose on people and I feel it. I'm with you, but it's also important to my craft to, to get that great photograph. The other thing is that if they if they, if you set them up, okay, here's a student group thing. I worked a student group and in student group. We say all the time that patients can accept anything if you will tell them it's coming in other words we shot uh we were in uh, uh, columbus Indiana, uh, columbus georgia and there just happens to be a railroad that goes right past the hospital so they can't keep it quiet at night and so what they do to get over overcome that is they say you know mr reynolds i we want it to be quiet at night but we have this train that's going to come by at 11 30 11 45 at night and it's going to wake you up there's no way we can get around that. We can give you earplugs. We can give you something to help you sleep, but we've never fixed that problem. And then Mr. Reynolds will hear it and it wakes him up and he goes, oh, well, that's what they just told me about. And he's fine. So if you start out by saying you're going to come over and take and I'm going to take photographs of you, but it's going to take some time. So it's not going to be 30 minutes. You're not going to walk in, go home. It's going to be walk in. We're going to talk. We're going to have a conversation about who you are. And when I'm going to try to take a photo of you and not just what you physically look like but who you are by the time you get to and you know to, to having a, a job person a horse you're probably not going to get there right away but i think and you can do it with friends how many of you ever get a chance to do things for free for exposure <laughs> yeah all the time right and so sometimes and you might say to the person for exposure but you're doing it my way all right and, 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 and I'm with you, Tony, I'll be right there. But, uh, the, uh, but to say to them, I'll do it for exposure, but I want to take a different kind of photograph. And then you end up with some of the stuff on your website that's like, ooh, oh, wow, there's something different there. And then you start telling people, I can do that, but that takes time. 
that's not a 20 minute shoot. Can I just interject real quick with Ann? Yeah. Okay. Um, because I, she did a presentation for wide angle photo. And so we all saw your work and I know one of the things that I really loved was you had some photos where it was clear because she's doing like families that come on vacation and so oh, they yeah. go down to the beach yeah. and you could see the kids wanted to play. The mom is the one that wants the photos. She set it up. The husband wants nothing to do with this and he's giving you the stink eye, but you mm -hmm. captured that. It's actually pretty funny. But then you also showed like you do all the post stuff and then you showed some really your best photos were when you just told them to just be themselves and play. And I don't know how you feel about them, but I thought that, I mean, they were all just exquisite. Not that the others weren't the post weren't, but they, it's, I think it speaks to, to his idea of time. By then, if, if kids, babies aren't crying yet, and you even had a baby crying and she got this beautiful photo of a sibling consoling them yeah. from the back. I yeah. mean, it's just beautiful. So you are taking, I can see that you take opportunities and you're working with what you have. I totally get that. Yeah. Especially with a group of people and some of them are kids and stuff. I totally get what you're saying, but I don't, you know, we, we that is actually being bold and we're going to stay for another 20 minutes and the baby's going to cry and the husband's going to hate you. All right. Are, are we in this to be like? No. You, if we went back to the guy with the fist. He's, he doesn't like the guy taking the photo. You're not in this to be liked. You're in this to make great art. And but I think it's do. expectations is what you're saying. Yeah. So if they know up front, you know what, this might take a little bit time, more time than X, Y, Z, but you're going to get something. You're going to get what you want. You're going to get something worth taking. And my, my daughter Anne would literally get down on the floor and crawl around on babies. And, and somewhere, somewhere in the 35 shots, shots of babies, babies, there'd be something really kind of cool. But she's down on the knees and, you know, crawling around with them. So I, I understand trying to get a photo of 35 people together. That it's almost impossible because somebody's always looking the wrong way or doing something stupid or ties wrong. That that didn't help at all. But I, I do appreciate that. How we, we have to be bold. This is not going to fall out of a tree on us. We're not going to make great photographs accidentally. You have to be bold. Be bold every time. Go out and be bold. Other questions? Magenta, did you have a question? No, if not, Gail, you're up. Okay. All of your information was excellent. Your only problem is that Yes. Now, how do we take your principles and apply them to the landscape? Right. Or a still life. Yeah. Yep. Or, you know, something showing transportation. Okay, so the, uh, Gail here has had a great question. Now she's backed me into the corner. Uh, Gail has asked, how do you take all of this information about telling stories and do it in a still life or landscape? All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to confess. So here's the thing that the saying is that in the Bible, the flood is the event, but the story is about Noah. So before you came in, we were talking about the, the, the person who, one of the vaccines that we just got, which one is it? Uh, do you know the vaccine was created by oh, a woman yeah. in a weekend. Yeah. Now the, the event is the vaccine. But the story is whatever her name is, Kismet. She's a black lady. And, and just remarkable. Every time there's a story, I love Ansel Adams. But there's not a story there. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, the story really is his incredible ability to get details. But every stories are always about people. Always. Always. It's all right. That's lightning. It's telling me it's time for me to shut up. But and so still life is fine. And I'm, most of the artists in the Renaissance who did a lot of still lives, they were doing that at home with their craft. craft. Now, Rembrandt would come in and he would say, if you painted an apple, we need to be able to go over in the bushel and pull out the apple that you painted. It looks so much like that apple. And so maybe what you're learning is you're developing that craft. You're developing that all the crazy stuff, the S stops and the, uh, all the it, uh, uh, ISOs and everything we have to be good at. And you're getting really good at that. But I don't think you're ever going to get a 
Maybe I'm wrong. I get a story out of a still life. But if you do, I'd love to see it. I mean, you take remarkable photos. I love, I love what they look like. But a story. I worked for a TV station in Nashville, Tennessee, and there was a big news director was a big guy and he was very aggressive. And we had a photographer and a, and a reporter. They go out and they shoot a story about widening the interstate. And they come back and they're new. And so they have to go and sit in front of Al Tompkins. And Al Tompkins, the news director, looked at the tape. This was a long time ago. Looked at the tape and he, and he took it out and he threw it on the floor and he stomped on it. And he said, that's not a story. He said, every good story is about people. Go out and get the story. And they said, no, wait a minute. We, we got people in there. We have the Tennessee Department of Transportation guy. We've got the mayor. We've got these. Those aren't people, he said. We need to know how this affects real people. And so they went back out and I saw the final story. And the final story that came back was this little lady, black lady, who had been in her house. She grew 87 years old, had lived in this house her whole life. And her parents had lived in this house their whole lives. And but every time that they widened the interstate, it get a little bit closer and a little bit closer to her back door. And this time when they put the breakdown lane so that when people, the semis came off the interstate and they started slowing down, they would throw rocks up against the back of her house and she couldn't sleep. So they told that story and they actually had a video camera out back and these rocks clung. It was a fantastic story. Every good story is about people. I don't know how Ansel Adams he could come beat me up on this. I don't know how he would react to that. I love Ansel Adams, but it's just even and and even the ones. Oh, who was it? Uh, yours I was with the with the frog. Yeah, you mentioned the Paula's frog looked very human-like. So maybe so we anthropomorphize, and if we see human within. and think about the the three dog or two dogs on the pier. Mm -hmm. The kind of the really compelling part of that was we can, I mean, maybe it's just me because I'm insane, insane, but I kind of looked, looked at their faces, faces and tried to figure out what's going on in, the, in their little dog brains. So it could be that even when they're not people, we still anthropomorphize. Anthropom anthropomorphize. What she said. <laughs> yes. I disagree somewhat about that. Like, whenever I saw the picture, the still life of the pedophores. The what? Pedophores, the little, um, the one that's. Oh, okay, yeah. So you, yeah. I was over in Switzerland or Austria and I went to a restaurant and they had those there. And so when I saw that picture, it to me that to a time yeah. in my life. Yeah. And I think that we instill life even. You know, you look at this an apple, and if you like apple, you remember, you know, or Got it. All right. Good. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, up in Chapman, Virginia, there is a one of the things I noticed about the South, the North of the North, is when uh, old people die, they leave the houses there to deteriorate the fall wind. Yeah. They don't knock them down. Up in Chapman, Virginia, there's a big there's a house and the vines have grown all over it. And you can see the outline of the house, you see the steps on it coming out. And if you look through the vines, you can see windows and even a dish towel in there. And that tells the story of You are so right. You are so right. To the house and to the area. You know, it's, there's so many there a number of people who put pictures of old houses that they were there for recent and the my see, and it, it tells the story of that area of how my my sister-in-law in law in um, Tennessee. There's the family house still there. Children and grandchildren bought, and the cousin built other houses around it. But the original house that belonged to mom and dad is still there for one day. I love this thought, and thank you for both of your comments. I think that's exactly it. And some, I mean, they, yeah, abandoned houses are cool because we get involved once again in the story of the house when it wasn't abandoned, when there were people there. So it is possible. Gail, back to your question, mm -hmm. that if you had uh, some tools out by the woodshed, 
that, that you would get the story of there's people working really hard here mm -hmm. and look at those tools all beat up and and I think I think it is possible. Yeah. We're all here. Is there a well, reason we no, don't want to do it? I'm thinking of our video mm -hmm. that I have to download and put on the website uh -huh. and the time. Gotcha. I, I think we are at time, are we not? We are. We're a little bit over, but that's... I. This is this is a, a lot of fun. Um, hopefully, it made you think in a slightly different way. The... Um, did you have a question? Uh, there was a word that said that I was really interested in. Was like, anthropomorphic. anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic means to make something human-like that isn't human-like. So, so it's almost like personification. Personification? Yeah. People, you, what's your first name? It's Paula. That. So Paula has a fantastic photograph of a frog coming up out of a, a plant. And I think what's so compelling about the frog is it looks like it's smiling and it's got these great eyes and you kind of we put human character, I do, because I'm insane, put human characteristics on that. Um, and I think that's what's really compelling. No, we all do that. That's, do we? Okay. Yeah, no, no. That's that's why you can take a picture of, a, like, they have, um, there's a whole series of people who have done art with, uh, like, wall sockets, and they make them look like human faces. We tend to, we, we our brains see faces where they don't right. exist. Right. We do the same thing with animals and Right. We find human-like characteristics in them and assign them. And I'm a scientist, and so one of the hardest things to do is get that out of your head. Mm -hmm. Because you do a scientific paper and you anthropomorphize, you're going to get crucified. You cannot do it. You know, if you're doing an animal study, it's an animal. It is not a human. Artists, on the other hand, that's what tells a story, I think, about an animal. If we can see something, if we can relate to something, whatever they're experiencing, I personally don't think there's that, that big a difference, difference between us. But scientifically, scientifically you're, you're not supposed to go there. there. But, but that's, that's what, what I think makes a great photograph or any piece of art is, is when you can see something that you can relate to in whatever animal or a plant even. Okay, if we have five more minutes, if you need to leave, leave, it's fine. The five more minutes, I go through a few things that filmmakers do that are different than what you're doing. My daughter, uh, I, Tell them about to talk about it all the way through. Her first art show, I, I went up to Atlanta and she had it all in this in this gallery. And she said, Dad, what do you think? And I said, Fantastic. And she said, What would you do differently? And I said, I would reorganize them. Why? And I said, Well, because as a filmmaker, I understand there's a film language. And that film language is how we see the world. And so if I'm going to just show you how filmmakers think that maybe you don't. And we actually did with her. We moved things around. So the first thing that we're going to show you as a filmmaker is an establishing shot. Because your story is going to be different if it's in New York City or my uh, the Yellowstone or Miami. We have to know where it is. I don't know if you guys think that way. But it may make sense. Paula, I really wanted to see now that we talked about it, your front yard that has this you know, incredible frog. We start with an establishing shot. Do it or don't do it, but it's different depending. Anna, when you're when you're shooting uh, the photographs, you shoot them like out at the beach and stuff. Yes. Yeah. So the where are we is a really good question. Next thing we do is we come. Okay, now we come inside and we're shooting here. We do a wide shot where we include everybody. Why do we do that? So we can see how people are going to relate to each other. And then we go down to the, the two shots. These are the shot. This is a film language. We went really quickly. Film is not that old. When they did one of the first films, it was called The Great Train Robbery. And the guy on screen looked at the camera, pulled out two guns, and shot at the, at the camera. And people ran out of the theater because they'd never experienced that. But now we, we're so smart that we're beginning to understand this is how we understand the world. What would happen as a still photographer if you thought of these shots? Do you ever see an over the shoulder shot in a still photograph? Why don't we do that? In film, this is stock and trade. We would never shoot a film that didn't have dozens of over the shoulder shots. And then that close up. We play with angles a lot because your point of view changes everything. 
So this, this, uh, from this point of view, it's like they call it the God shot, and it's looking down, and it makes the people seem small and vulnerable. And the opposite of that is the low angle shot. There's a lot. There's a trope. There's a, a, a cliche in films where you will get if you're showing people getting stuff out of a trunk, somebody's going to get in the trunk with a camera and shoot the low angle of that. Do we do that in still photography? And if not, why not? This in Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane made everybody look massive, especially especially um, the, the main character, Orson Welles. By getting the camera lower and lower and lower until it's literally on the floor. And then I told you about uh, Drew Barrymore, that he shot the entire ET from her point of view. There's also, I don't have a slide in here on this, but the 12 Angry Men was a, was a movie about these 12 jurors who were trying to decide the fate of a, of a man who had been accused of doing something terrible. And when they began, they shot it from above and then made it seem sort of inconsequential. What are you going to do? Everybody thinks he's guilty. Move on. But then over time, they begin to bring the camera down and down and down toward the end. It's that shot like this. It's shot from so far below that everything they do seems monumental. Mm -hmm. Are we as still photographers thinking of camera angles, thinking how this matters and this changes everything? using things as far foreground objects this is this is a whole story right there i mean obviously we've seen the graduate but it's all comprised in, the, in that one image using a frame within a frame and this is what you were talking about um tell me your first name i know magenta but i don't know your first name diane, diane. diane. <laughs> um this is what you were talking about the, with the 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 uh, old houses. Yeah, there's so many opportunities for us to frame something within the frame. I'm not sure if we do it. Filmmakers do it all of the time. And then and then one of my, my favorite, favorite movie stills, stills of all time, time is from Manhattan. Manhattan. And this is just as gorgeous as it gets. But we try to at the end, we did an establishing shot at the beginning. We went close, 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 detail, 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 back the way, back the way. And then we usually will leave you and I'll leave you with a wide shot. And it is that wide shot that tells you that it's all over. So this is this is uh, one of my favorites of all time. All right, good, good, good. We're just closing up, folks. <laughs> no, you're fine. Oh, that's great. We're, we that's, ran over a few minutes. That's Rob and Wendy of uh, Kelly Ass. What was the movie? This Manhattan, Woody Allen film, and some of the most beautiful photography ever. All right, guys. Thank you for everything. Thank you guys there at home for being here. That was fantastic. That well, was good. It was really good. Okay. And thank you guys. I don't see any questions in the chat. So with that, we will I'm I'm talking to the folks that are virtual. I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave the call. So Last answer questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for attending. Yes. What I didn't use this. Okay. No, but I mean, it's, it's, it's without a doubt. Some we could walk through the gallery and I could show you. And so, why is this compelling? Why, like the two dogs on the dock? Why is that? That really is compelling. Why? Well, because it seems like there's a lot going on there. Your photographs and Kirby, Kirby, Kirby is yes. still impossibly beautiful. But they don't tell a story. I don't think that maybe I'm wrong. Well, I think that we both need to be emotional. Yeah, so it's you know, it's a what if you were doing that? Okay, who was going to tell a story? And at some point in time, with a flower sack. And then you really tried to, before you look back on, you're growing up as old as me, when I was a child. But 
Why would it have to like when we were six or eight or twelve years old? What would it make up? That's an interesting thing. Yeah. Because then you might look at it and go, wow, I haven't had an RC cola. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He's Caligas. Yeah, yeah, I called him just the other day because yeah. I've got a camera that died on me. Uh, Wait. If it's just a normal off switch, then that's simple. That's not a. Well, it's. It, it, I mean, it's a thing. Sometimes it turns on something. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of logic with it. That's not the only thing. Is he going to go Pardon? Does he have another cut of Oh, I'm sure he does. Are these his paws? Yeah. Um, 
grade. Oh wow. And it was the only grade, the only school in the grade section until 2006. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and if you get a hold of the grandparents' scrapbook, I'll tell you. <laughs> I mean, I got pictures of my great grandmother turning butter in Maine. Yeah. Yeah, and my one, and my one, my father's mother was one of 14 kids, a whole family of 14 of them. Yeah. Yeah, I um. Yeah, I do the Well, we are glad you are here. We need yeah, I know. You, you come to almost every meeting, too. We need more Yankees. <laughs> and the I am a former Yankee. I'm never going back to snow. <laughs> There's a reason, too, why old folks come to Florida and they can I absolutely loved being in Boston, but I have to tell you, if you freeze to death. Oh, yeah. It just, it, and it's, it's inescapable. I'm headed back, um, okay, the 18th of September to October 9th, and I'm going to Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, because that's where I once lived in 1958. I had this crazy thing that moved all around. Mm -hmm. and, and the picture that I don't have that I wish I had, they have so much snow there, you know, the crossbars on the um, telephone lines. Yeah. The clouds was wide and there's a great big pile of snow. And the three of us kids were standing on top of the plow pile oh. at the crossbar of the telephone pole. Oh, that is wow. dangerous. Yeah. It was, it was an interesting experience, but we'll never do it again. <laughs>